5, talking about living in the light of God that has been provided to us. We'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14, what it means to live in the light. Ephesians 5, starting at verse 8. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of these things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let us pray. Father, we pray that your light would shine on us through your spirit, that we would understand the light that comes from you, the path that you have illuminated for us, and that you would not only show us the pitfalls, but in that illumination that you would continue to bring understanding and wisdom and discernment and faithfulness. May we walk in the way that you have for us, shining that light before us, which is your word. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So whenever anyone remembers the history and the progression of comics, if we'll go to that comic slide, the world of comics have come a long way since that initial Superman or Spider-Man. As you might know, one of the driving forces in modern entertainment industry are the superhero franchises and every possible combination you could ever think of. That there's a strict timetable, there is a, a certain progress in that meta narrative and story, and each character is playing one particular part in that. That it comes through a, a sequence of events bringing out a broad picture, a broad time, a broad story. And of course, in the simple description of what is going on in these stories, you have a comparison between. The good guys, which are the ones of the light, and the bad guys, and their dark activities. Now, that, of course, is a very simplistic way to talk about what is evident in the world around us, that in this figurative use of light, we're talking about two aspects. We're talking about intellectual, and we're talking about moral. Intellectually, we're talking about that which represents truth. Whereas, in terms of morality, we're talking about holiness. So, their living in the light means to live in truth and with holiness. And the flip side to that, for the darkness, is the same way of having two elements as well. Intellectually, the dark, uh, darkness would represent ignorance or falsehood. And morally, it would talk about the existence of evil. So both the intellectual aspects of what someone knows and believes and the moral aspect pertaining to what one thinks or one acts has a bearing upon everything in their lives. What we are looking at this morning from Ephesians 5, 8 through 14 is talking about and continuing the phrase first began in the opening of the chapter of what it means to be imitators or children of God. And we are to do that to imitate God and love, uh, the way of love that he has for us. And there needs to be an understanding and a living forth for what is true and what is right. That is what is being talked about in the living out of that light in verses 8 through 14. It's one of imitating God in relation to the picture of light. And God always gives the indicative before the imperative. He always explains what is, who he is, what he has done, before he tells you what you need to do and be because of that. So in five very practical and, and straightforward ways, the Apostle Paul here is going to talk to us about what it means to faithfully live out in God's light. And these are the five ways he describes it. He talks about the contrast in verse 8. The characteristics in verse 9 through 10, the command in the beginning of verse 11, the commission in verses 11 through 13, and then finally the call to that of Christians 
living as children of light in verse 14. So let's look first in the contrast in verse 8. So Paul here is contrasting a believer's life before and after salvation. And he's illustrating that point here of darkness and light. And he's talking about a time in the past. That's why he describes this here at one time. It's in the past tense. He's saying something that no longer exists. That's why he says with the modifier here that you were or formerly in this way. He's explained it to the Ephesians, for example, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, the way we formerly walked according to the course of this world, etc. But what's fascinating is how he describes this situation. Not necessarily that you were walking in darkness. How does he describe it in our text in verse 8? You were darkness. You see, it's, it's awful hard to excuse the sin as just some sort of slip up or sometimes I just don't get it right. What he's saying is before Christ, this is the natural course of your life in darkness. You cannot and you will not lead a holy, devout, and godly life. Why is that the case? Well, because apart from faith in Christ, we are unholy, profane, and ungodly. This is the natural state. This is the inherited sin and guilt that we have. For Christians, both intellectually and morally, darkness is described here as a thing of the past. It describes the previous life and the change to that life. One that was previously characterized by sin and darkness, now God changing that. But what does that destiny and that change look like? Let's go look at to the Gospel of John, John chapter 3. This John, both in the Gospels and the Epistles and in Revelation, will often use this picture of light and darkness to contrast realities. Why people are in this situation. You know, really, why, why do people like darkness and are not seeking deliverance? Why do they turn away from the light that has come from heaven, Jesus Christ? and his way, and his righteousness, even when it reveals that they are darkness, and in darkness, and following the path of darkness. John simply, and successfully, and succinctly describes this in John chapter 3, starting at verse 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. See, Paul is talking about this change in reality back in Ephesians 5 eight. That those who are redeemed are in this state right now. We are now light in the Lord. And it's talking about a condition. Not only just walking in the light, we're characterized as believers, as reflective of the light that is from heaven. That's why Jesus said, Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. And we are to walk as children of light. A man once was on a far trip, and he decided to bring back gifts for his family. And for his wife, he brought back a very fine, exquisite matchbox that was gold with, with special uh, illumination features on it to his wife from France. He didn't read French and, and couldn't interpret what it was saying, and he gave it to his wife, and he, he boasted that, this matchbox is so exquisite, not only does it dazzle in the light, but even if you turn out the lights, it will provide an illumination that you cannot believe. And she said, I've never heard of such a thing. Let me see it. So he quickly turned out the lights after he got the matchbox out from his pocket and realized that it didn't glow at all. And he couldn't figure out what was really wrong. So he got a friend to read the inscription on the box that was written in French, and it translated like this. If you want me to shine in the night, keep me in the light. It was 
the light that would come and shine on this box that would enable, obviously when the lights got turned out, to shine. And isn't this supposed to be a beautiful illustration of what believers are supposed to be? Think of Moses when he came into the presence of God. Even leaving the presence of God, his face shone. And this is the same type of reflection that we are to have in a dark world. But how does it happen? It only happens if we are reflecting the light that has come from above. If we think we can self-generate this light, or make, or heaven forbid, make up our own light, we will be dark as the world is dark. But the more time we spend with Jesus in prayer, the more we desire to worship and serve him, we then become godly reflectors of the light that is from above. Now, second, for Christians to be living in the light as God's own children of light, one must see the characteristics. Verse 9 and 10. So what almost might seem to be an aside that Paul's making here, he's actually talking about what manifests for children of light. See, what's given here, what Paul calls the, the fruit of light. And he's giving three supreme characteristics or fruit of walking as children of light. We are all that is good and right and true. It's not that we're just enlightened to God's truth, but we are filled with light. Notice the first one, first characteristic, all that is good. This is reflecting that moral or ethical excellence, good in both nature and effectiveness. This is, this is what a, a life manifested, of course, to the, the fruit of the Spirit in itself. One of them is goodness. And it's manifested here as light, reflecting God's goodness to others. Secondly, he just uses the, the fruit analogy itself. This is what's being... Um, Walking in righteousness, how you live, it, what would characterize your life. And, and we can even see that, um, getting back to the example of uh, a bunch of grapes that you might hold. I won't even deal with spiders that might hide in those, but uh, <laughs> it's a little creepy of a thought. But if you deal with grapes, it's sometimes easy if you, you don't see below the surface uh, that there might be one or two spoiled grapes, right? But... There's what would be the indication of the, the grapes that you would have. Although you may get one or two that don't reflect that quality, they're removed, so they may not spoil the rest of the fruit. It's the same thing with our lives. It, it's not that there's going to be a complete perfection in all the fruit that we manifest, but what is that, what is that pruning? I'm not even sure what you talk about removing spoiled fruit. What, what is when you take out those bad grapes from that bunch? It's so it might not affect those other elements. Because if there's one element in our life that is tainted, just like a piece of spoiled fruit, it starts to taint every other element of our life. And then the third fruit of light is expressed here, that intellectual sense, in truth. Moral, saving truth. It's not only something to be known, but it's actually expressed here as something to be done. And how it impacts. It's, it does no good, for example, to know how to do CPR when somebody is dying. And say, yeah, I, does anyone know CPR? This man is dying. Yeah, I know CPR. See you later. It's the same thing with what the truth is revealed to us. It's putting that truth in practice. First, we have to know what to do. But we also have to put that truth in practice in order to be that fruit of light. And so he says in this, the goodness, the righteousness and truth is all that is good. It's talking about our relationship with others. The fruit of light. This is what it's found or consists in. What is good, right, and true. And so as far as this walk is, in verse 10, he says, The focus now to be concerned, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And so this is one the word discern here means to examine, to put to the test. If you were going to consume some fruit, for example, I would hope, especially if it's a bunch of grapes, for example, that you would, I won't get back, should I get back to that spider analogy? Well, yeah, if you don't look out what's in there, uh, more like bananas. I think that happens more in bananas. Sorry, did I really get you off track with the, the spider's analogy? But you, you take that fruit and you want to say, okay, is everything good in here? 
what, what's hiding? I, there needs to be some examination because, yes, things you don't know can actually hurt you. So he's saying here, okay, now put this truth into practice, what is pleasing to the Lord. To be obedient, to discern what you have. It's, you know, you heard the expression, it's always good to keep an open mind. Well, it really, doesn't it depend on what you're keeping that mind open to? Because if it is falsehood, if it is what's not honoring to the Lord, and we continue to fill our mind with those things, that's, that's why Romans talk about whatever is good and pleasing and holy, think on these things. And how can we do that? Only if more comes into our minds that is good and holy and righteousness, than, which is often the negativity that can be around us. But how does this discernment work? Please turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. This discernment can only properly happen through the, the work of the Spirit. And it is difficult work. How do we become proficient in anything, any sphere of life? There's one of trial and testing. You don't become a good athlete or a good scientist or a good carpenter just by whatever... There's continually refocus of what you're doing and study and examination. And, and this is what Peter is talking about in 2 Peter 1 about dealing with the truth, the work that needs to be done in order to discern or to learn. Notice his words starting at verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For these qualities are yours and are increasing, and they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance in the internal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's not doing a bunch of things meriting salvation. This is what it means to see, to, to make our calling and election sure. There's lots of tests. The entire book of 1 John is a test. Say you're a believer, does this reflect in your life? You, you say you love God, can people see this? And do you notice how all these qualities are tied together? Somehow, we, we think that we can isolate one element of our life from the other. What we take in intellectually somehow is, is isolated from what we speak out verbally. In all these things, they're like a chain. And the strength of our life is only as strong as that weakest chain. If the knowledge isn't coming in, if we're not speaking that righteousness, if we're not showing that forgiveness, if we're not extending that godliness, if we are not seeking in that perseverance, etc., 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 there will be a breakdown in one of those qualities. We can't expect to excel in love, which you notice is at the end of that list in verse 7, if we have not put that difficult work in of everything that comes to that place. Make every effort. Christianity, ladies and gentlemen, is hard work. Continually refining. Continually learning. Continually seeking forgiveness. Continually striving and persevering. Somehow we think we're going to come to faith and it's just going to be easy. And Christ is saying, guess what? This is now going to be the start of the hardest thing ever in your life. But the difference is, I will go with you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I will shoulder that difficulty and you will now see things that you would never have imagined before because I'm now going to do them through you. There's an interesting factor that pilots experience flying at night. Yes, it is a glorious thing to see a city from above at night, but 
the ability for a pilot to deal with night vision is often a life and death issue. For things can often trick their vision. Exactly how much illumination is in the cockpit can have a bearing on what one sees outside. Even something as simple as houses illuminated at night can make a difference where a pilot can experience where horizon is. Because on a cloudy night where the stars might be canopied by the clouds, somebody may perceive the houses down below as to be the stars and mistake where the horizon is, leading to a disastrous mistake. But the one thing that a pilot is looking for, perhaps even in times where some of the smaller aircraft might not have a lot of the sophisticated navigation capabilities, is a particular light one particular light, well even before the pilot gets to the runway. It's different from airplane, airport to airport, but a lot of them have a flashing light of rotation of white and green and white and green and white and green. And the purpose of that not only is to distinguish from other high buildings and towers, but to say that's where home is. And so a pilot then seeks to orient his or her plane in order to find that place of home. That it would be a light that would distinguish itself from the houses around, from the stars above, from towers. And this is the same type of light that God calls us to shine. A light that is distinguished from all the bright lights of distraction in the world. Is there a quality and purity of that light that can then be distinguished from all those other flashing lights that are around us? This is what it means to reflect the holy light of God. Now third, Christians to be living in the light as God's own children of light must see the command. In the beginning of verse 11 of chapter 5 of Ephesians. To take no part or participate or koinonia or fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So what he's saying here is there will be an indication of your fellowship by what I see your participation is in. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 for the explanation of what that looks like. In all the ways that light is described in Scripture, there is a description about how our light should shine. Don't put your light under a bushel or, or hide it. it. It must not be confused but must be distinguished. And it should be distinguished morally from wickedness, intellectually from what is error. And often Paul and the other writers will talk about if this is truth, this is falsehood. If this is the way of righteousness, this is the way of destruction. So we may understand what the difference is in that path to what the Word of God is illuminating. Notice starting in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 5, that distinguishing. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world or the greedy, or the swindlers, or the idolaters, since then you would, have to, you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality, or greed, or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those inside the church you are to judge, God judges those outside, purge the evil person from among you. And you think, well, how can this, this seem so harsh? Granted, and we're going to get to Matthew 18, that makes those distinguishing of redemptive actions that comes before this point. But for somebody who is living that continual life of rejecting the path of righteousness, there is no real fellowship, oneness and purpose and understanding and of love so don't pretend there is. And it's not, well, okay, let's distinguish anything that would be from truth or, or falsehood, from morality or righteousness. We'll just consider, our, we'll, we'll consider these differences and we'll just call ourselves one. That never reflects unity. 
The unity starts in our lordship to Christ, and all those who call him Lord will come together and express that unity. That's why, for example, theologically we make a confession of faith. This is what we believe. And what are we saying in that? If we believe that Jesus is Lord, we do not believe that he is merely a created being, that he is a, a secondary prophet, or that he is just one other person like us just struggling to get by, or even perhaps a mythological figure that just gives us moral lessons. We're saying this is who Christ is and our allegiance is to him, and this is not. And so this is what it means to walk as that children of light. Why, why must there that be striving of purity and holiness? Because if we're going to bear the name of Christ, we have to walk that name of Christ. And you think, well, who are you to judge? Is it not those inside the church who you are to judge? Verse 12 seems almost like, how, really? I thought God is the only one to judge. Well, he says, verse 13, the world, but he wants us to distinguish. He wants us to prove in ourselves. That's why we started there. Make your calling and election sure. Self-judge. Are you in Christ? And if you're going to assemble, is there the standard of the allegiance to Christ that's evident among you? That's why Paul gets back in Ephesians 5 to have nothing to do with the unfruitful works or deeds of darkness. And he, he leads it very open because through all of chapter 4 and 5, he's going to, much like what we just read in Corinthians 5, distinguish what these things are. Darkness can have a profound effect not only with its grip on an individual, but also broader wide. One of the most famous periods of uh, darkness historically in, in recent memory was in 1977 in New York City. It was known as the great blackouts of the city. And the first time the series of blackouts came, people thought it was kind of neat. You just sort of stopped what you were doing, and you thought, well, we're just going to enjoy the darkness. And the lights came back on in a relatively short time, but that was not the case in the second series of blackouts that happened in that year. Because in the absence of all illumination, there was a horrific evil that seemed to overtake the city. There were break-ins of businesses, there were uh, personal assaults, and it seemed like darkness was running amok amongst the city. Yet, in amongst all that law-breaking and mob rule, there were a few that said, enough is enough, and got their flashlights and candles and car lights and brought illumination to that dark city. In essence, they became that light in the midst of that darkness. And this is the same situation that we live in the world. There is a moral and intellectual darkness. And we are to bring the light of the gospel lived out in our lives to show that there is a way of life and not a despair of darkness. Now, fourth, Christians living in the light as God's own children of light must see the commission. Second half of verse 11 through verse 13. It's actually a very difficult one. It, it actually says here for us to expose these works of darkness, to illuminate what is going on here. How should this properly be done at the start? I said I'd get to it, so let's get to it now. Matthew 18. Would you please turn there? Because Paul in his description in Ephesians 5 and verse 12 said, It is shameful or disgraceful even to speak of these that they do in secret. And there is a description here about failing to do that self-examination, that sense of standard amongst the congregation, and where this should start and how it should progress. In a very famous passage, but crucial to understanding of this distinguishing, let's look in Matthew 18, starting at verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell, it, tell him his fault, being you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others among 
with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Where is usually the failing in this? Right at the beginning in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. What does this not mean? If your brother sins against you, I'm going to wait till that person comes to me. I've done nothing wrong. If your brother sins against you, I don't need him. Out of here. If your brother sins against you, you know what? Let me tell you what he did. Hey, everybody. If your brother sins against you, you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. The purpose of this is always redemptive. Always seeking reconciliation. Not avoiding, not gossiping, certainly not exiting. That there would not be a sense of animosity and division. And the whole point of this is that this would end in verse 15. That there would be such a sense of maturity that the nature of this difficulty would happen between the two people involved. Before we would get to the point of verse 16, of taking others along. Yet, even before that, before the congregation. There is always that extension of graciousness. Can there be a healing on a one-to-one -one basis, that the offense may not be escalated, may it not be broadcast, may it sure not be avoided, but there can be godly reconciliation. That's why back in Ephesians 5 and verse 13, when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. And this is that exposing here. It's, we're trying to bring light to the situation, not comp not deal with a problem in darkness, either avoiding it or covering it up. That's what dealing with it in darkness is. But dealing with it in light is that light that can be shared to illuminate the situation. One of the aspects of that discernment in bringing the darkness to light is often and continually gotten wrong by even the church culture. There is an effort sometimes in even discernment ministries or uh, public proclamations of current events in an effort to shame people. That this person has got it wrong. How can somebody be so foolish? Hey, everybody, why don't you come and take a look at this moron here? The purpose of the gospel is to bring healing and reconciliation. The purpose when something is of the works of darkness is to bring the light of the gospel one-on-one -on -one to that individual. Frankly, because there has to be big public announcements in the modern press and in the modern media is a failure for the church to do what the church is supposed to be doing. Because if we were actually reflectors, each and every one of us, of that light, there would be no need for those big public pronouncements. This is the redemptive work that each of us has. Now finally and only briefly, for Christians to be living in the light as God's own children of light, one must see the call in verse 14. There's an invitation here. Everything that becomes visible is light. It makes things manifest. Let's not keep things hidden. And some believe in verse 14, it's a citation of Isaiah 60 in verse 1, which reads, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And you might be asleep at this point. I don't know how long to talk, 40 minutes or so? And you think, okay, what does this have to do with me? I'm, I don't have any problems. Okay, can we just go to lunch? And verse 14 talks about us to awake from this slumber. 
because this is a reality. It's a reality in each of our lives. It's a reality among us, and it's not someone else's job. You notice as we went through Matthew 18, it didn't say, when you have an issue against your brother, you go to the pastor and tell him, and he'll take care of it for you. If you have an issue against your brother, find another church where you, have, you don't need to deal with your brother. If you have an issue against your brother, you make sure you go tell some of the people you live around or you go with your daily activities, let them know what they did. Because he concludes here that Christ will shine on you. He is, he is the one that will provide that healing and that light to this situation. I just want to close with these words for with her. Horatius Bonar, he wrote it like this. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found him, my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days be done. Christ is calling us for the full light of the gospel to shine into our lives. That our lives would literally radiate Jesus to a dark world. And for Jesus to say, you are the light of the world, is just to be what we are. This is this application of light. Go and be what you are in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we often look for the, the things that are to come and long for physical healings, long for things that we've wanted to have or to do, and often we miss what we already are. For if our only focus is on what we don't have, we fail to appreciate who we are and what we do have. Lord, help us to celebrate that. Help us to have the light of your gospel shine in our lives and amongst us, that there would be no division, that there would be unity, that there would be love and forgiveness and fellowship. And we know that fellowship only happens through you. In lives surrendered unto you, lives lived unto you, and a gospel professed of who you are. We thank you for what you have already given us. Help us to be the light that we already are. In your name we pray, amen.